On the podcast today, we are going to speak about chapter 67 of the Tao Te Ching, which makes up the 67th episode of the 81 Meditations on the Tao Te Ching. And as usual, Guyang will read Jia Fu Feng and Jane English's translation, and I will read Derek Lin's translation. Everyone under heaven says that my Tao is great and beyond compare. Because it is great, it seems different. If it were not different, it would have vanished long ago. I have three treasures which I hold and keep. The first is mercy, the second is economy, the third is daring not to be ahead of others. From mercy comes courage, from economy comes generosity, from humility comes leadership. Nowadays people shun mercy but try to be brave. They abandon economy but try to be generous. They do not believe in humility but always try to be first. This is certain death. Mercy brings victory in battle and strength in defense. It is the means by which heaven saves and guards. Everyone in the world calls my Tao great, as if it is beyond compare. It is only because of its greatness that it seems beyond compare. If it can be compared, it would already be insignificant long ago. I have three treasures. I hold on to them and protect them. The first is called compassion. The second is called conservation. The third is called not daring to be ahead in the world. Compassionate, thus able to have courage. Conserving, thus able to reach widely. Not daring to be ahead in the world, thus able to assume leadership. Now if one has courage but discards compassion, reaches widely but discards conservation, goes ahead but discards being behind, then death. If one fights with compassion, then victory, with defense, then security. Heaven shall save them, and with compassion, guard them. In this chapter, Lao Tzu speaks about three treasures that we need to hold on to and protect in our life, and they are compassion or or mercy, and conservation, economy, and also humility. And these are the three treasures, as I said, that Lao Tzu would advise us to hold on to throughout our life that allows us to essentially align with the Tao. Yes, that's right. Um, Those three elements are very uh, important and actually very uh, creating very foundation of what the nature of Tao is really. So actually in the very first paragraph, uh, um, Lao Tzu starts with uh, the greatness of the Tao, right? In... um, Derek Lin's translation, he mentioned this compare, right? That's actually, Tao cannot be compared, right? Incomparable, right? So, and in this translation says, uh, word, use the word uh, different, right? It seems different. Or it can be also uh, used as a useless, it seems useless. If we were to explain the nature of Tao to just the, any random person who have no knowledge of um, Eastern philosophy would think that uh, what's the use of that, right? right. And even these three treasures, uh, compassion, conservation, humility, they're the same, right? You mentioned to, even nowadays, you mentioned to um, people, although they really know the importance and the value in their heart, but they find it hard to actually uh, take in action in their real life, right, Mm. for some reason. So that uh, incomparable nature of Tao and different and somewhat useless useless, uh, aspect of this uh, nature of Tao, right, in some sense. Uh, In actually chapter 41 earlier uh, says about how great and how abstract actually the nature of Tao is. So Lao Tzu actually mentions that the foolish student that hears about the Tao, he will laugh out loud. If he wasn't, it wouldn't be the Tao. So he actually, again, like put in a very poetic and funny way that how Tao is a very like vast and a very great and also very abstract to understand for a lot of people. That's right. As you said, like the Tao is incomparable, right? So it's not of the material world. So how can we compare it, right? Like, so we can say, oh, that's a, a big guy. 
but then you contrast that guy to another person there's always someone else that's bigger taller and on and on, on right like you can you can always compare something to something else and there's always a, a comparison and so Lao Tzu's trying to talk here about the the infinite non-dual nature of Tao so in the field of duality we can always compare things high and low hot and cold so yeah, forth and so yeah. on left or right left or right <laughs> but in the field of Tao there is no comparison it's infinite it's eternal and it is non-dual so it's there's nothing that you can compare it to so to speak we can understand it in some sense not essentially what it is but we can understand where it is in that sense in that kind of felt experience of it this is the same as brahman in advaita vedanta and so it's it's this undifferentiated state of consciousness that again undifferentiated it can't be differentiated it can't be compared to something right so we can differentiate our individual states of consciousness to each other but when we speak about this ultimate sort of substratum which is what the Tao is which flows through us that is incomparable and that's what Tao, Lao Tzu has been trying to get us to understand throughout the Tao Te Ching mm. but in this chapter he kind of hones in on it that anything in the world cannot be compared to the Tao right. and no matter how rich you are no matter how cool you think your Lamborghini is if you put your Lamborghini into the furnace it melts down it's no longer a Lamborghini but the what empowers the furnace what empowers the Lamborghini what empowers the people to build the Lamborghini this is the Tao and so again it is incomparable we can understand it through life but we can't understand sort of what it is in its in its kind of infinite to- totality yes i think if um we see the world in the, just a finite perspective you always uh, come to the dualistic mind and that always kind of bring the comparison again mm-hmm. but if you come from the seeing the world in an infinite perspective like a nature of the Tao, mm. then you will be able to understand like a beyond the quality, I think. Mm. Again, beyond the comparison, yeah. beyond what's useful or use, useless, yeah. this kind of um, conceptual idea, right? Yeah. And again, um, Lao Tzu overly uh, emphasized on that way of uh, seeing the world, that the infinite um, perspective of seeing the world and the universe. Yeah, well, if you're a spiritual aspirant or if you are a, a budding Taoist, you, as you said, you have to come to that place where you're seen beyond this kind of duality of the world, right? And, you know, using comparison is, is a good example, as you were saying, like, because as Theodore Roosevelt said, like, comparison is a thief of joy. And he understood that without social media... <laughs> <laughs> so you see obviously with social media like it's kind of a heightened comparison right like where people look at each other's profiles and this and that and judge their own life based on other people's lives when it's all an illusion because most people are just projecting a type of personality on their social media accounts this is what hans georg Moella and paul d'ambrosio call pro, pro felicity mm-hmm. right so you have this Profilicity, like this is even beyond the identity. It, it's it's a it's a mask of of the identity, right? But it's only the identity showing to others what it wants them to see. And so, the sad thing is because most people come to social media with in an innocent way, right? We all did once upon a time. It came to social media as it was fun at the beginning, right? Not much anymore. But we we would come to it with an innocent mind. And, you know, you joke around with your friends and this and that. But then it slowly became a tool of comparison. And so when you're in this field of comparison, as Lao Tzu is suggesting, you eventually suffer. Yeah. Because you're constantly comparing this or that. So you're comparing, you know, in that sense, your life to someone else's, which is the worst thing. Because when you're comparing your life to someone else's, you're doing one essential mistake. You're not living your life, Mm. right? Or you're trying to live someone else's life or you're trying to tear those people down, which is even, you know, that's even a worse thing, right? 
where you get this, how social media have trained people to communicate and this and that, you know, what, and some people will say to me, why don't you converse with us online? And they speak in a certain way in the site, but I don't, I speak in a natural way. I don't speak in the way social media has trained people to communicate. So uh, I'm not an adherent of the religion of technology, right? Like, so I've, most people still do follow the natural way, but the religion of technology has taught people to communicate a certain way online, which is very unnatural. And so if you were to abide by that or you were to engage in that, you are becoming a victim of that mm. type of indoctrination. And part of that indoctrination of the religion of technology is the cult of comparison, is comparing your life to others. And so when you come to Eastern philosophy and spirituality and you come to Taoism, as a spiritual aspirant, you, your goal, in a sense, is to have the impartial perspective of life, not this partial perspective. And then you can live your life in a, in a free and easy way mm. because you are aligned with the, the oneness of the Tao. And you are not worried about what your neighbours are doing or what someone on social media is doing. You're happy in your own life and content with that. That's right. You know, a lot of our discontent comes from comparing our lives, the American dream. Right, the American dream has been promoted for let's say fifty years, and it's turned into an American nightmare. And that type of American dream is is that template has been superimposed onto other cultures, where look, if you succeed and and you have all this money and you have the big house and this and that, apparently you've made it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those people are more miserable than people who don't have a pot to piss in. Right, so there's a fine line between sanity and insanity in this world so you have to be very careful about what society promotes as something healthy and good for you you have to keep a discerning eye and also getting out of this game of this and that mm. of, of comparing your life to others and this and that because if you are serious and i sadly see in the comments on my videos and i see it on other people's videos and so forth and so on people who say they're spiritual aspirants but they communicate with the religion of technology that kind of internet apathy, what I call it, where social media has trained people to communicate a certain way to strangers they've never met, you, you've already fallen off the path of following this impartial perspective of Taoism, where you're, as to get back to what you were saying, you're trying to come back into this field mm. where you're outside of duality. Not outside of duality, you're sort of in duality, but you, you're like Zhuangzi, you see the infinite in all things. Yes. So you have that perception where you can see reality as it truly is rather than as your mind calculates it to be. That's right. Unfortunately, the, because of the social media and the smartphone, this um, yeah, cult of comparison and uh, like a way of communication these days on, on social media and off, online and offline had become like a culture, right? And... Uh, once it's settled as culture, like people um, start to defend it and they think that is the right thing to do and how you should be, right? But if the culture, again, the, the famous saying by Terence McKenna, the culture is not your friend, right? Only because that's what everyone else is doing doesn't mean that is the right thing to be doing, right? Probably that's more of the evidence of the general public's in intellectual level, maybe. That's what might be what it is. So uh, you don't have to follow the herd, right? And uh, if you don't agree with it. And you don't have to feel fearful of that too. And uh, what, I've, what I fear about uh, what's happening around the world is that I see this culture as like a disease. And everyone is infected. <laughs> <laughs> So, and cure for that is to turn yourself into the deeper knowledge, like what we're talking about here, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what we need to be aware of. And again, the, through this chapter, Lao Tzu is explaining the uh, three, chapter, uh, three um, treasures for us to follow uh, what, uh, what it's like to be a true Taoist, right? And ta Taoist sage. At least we're trying to, you know, like... Uh, emulate the the nature of it and uh, that's how we need how we how, that's how we can cure that uh, disease of cult of comparison that's right that's right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well that's why he's offering these to protect us from 
that type of as you said, it, it is a culture. Well, it's not a culture. I mean, it's what people believe is a culture. You yes. want you want to see a culture? Go to India. That's a culture. You want to see a culture? Study Taoism and history of Taoism. Something that's evolved over thousands of years. A few rich people that create a few platforms and people flock to them like bees to honey. Then that's not a culture, right? That's just something fancy that's there, and then you've created this illusory idea of what a culture is it's basically just an online environment where people begin to communicate and, th- and mimic what they see mimic like even if we look at the english language right the english language is continually being downgraded mm. and people's vocabulary is poor people will use peoples for singular instead of person you know so it's this is what is happening online and so, as you were saying, the way to protect yourself from this, and Lao Tzu was talking back in the Warring States period of China because he knew how particular social programs like Confucianism or like the internet can affect people's minds and make them think in very strange ways and they can disconnect from their nature. And that's what's happening, right? You're disconnected mm-hmm. from your nature. You can't even communicate with someone face-to-face. You speak to strangers online in a comment section Someone you, you don't know, mind you, you've never met in your life, and you speak to them in a very negative way, which, you know, if we had have said that to someone 30 years ago, they would have said, why would that person do that? But it's accepted. And so we come back to the three treasures in yes. how to deal with this, right? And so we come to the first one, which is obviously compassion or mercy. And so you have to think here like a Taoist, like a true Buddhist, and I'll get to that in a second, and like a obviously a a true Hindu, where your compassion is impartial, right? And so what we sadly see in the modern day is these fake Buddhist teachers in the West, particularly in America, who say they practice karuna, compassion, altruism, but they have a political orientation. So they're not impartial. And I've spoken personally to some of these teachers and they are all about division. Mm. they are and it's sad because they're they're not impartial they're not following the buddha's teachings but they have a lot of followers and i won't name names because i'm not into throwing people under the bus but you need to keep a discerning eye as soon as you see someone on x or on facebook or and they say that they're a roshi for example and then that they're openly you know divisive and they're openly or they have a political orientation ask yourself did the buddha have that Are they following the teachings of the Buddha? But they're not. And so what you're seeing in places such as America with these fake uh, Buddhist teachers is that they have an agenda to push, which is actually a political agenda. It's Because as soon as you go to like a monastery or or you go to a temple, right, or or you go to one of these places they have in America where uh, people want to learn about Buddhism, as soon as they bring up divisive ideologies or those type of uh, new ideologies that were created by tech companies and this and that for to get people to fall in line, you've got to immediately walk out. Because if they're not talking about the teachings of the Buddha, they're not talking about the Pali Canon or they're not talking about Vajrayana Buddhism or the Mahayana or, or you know any of the great lineages of Buddhism, if they're not te- teaching the Buddha's teachings, immediately leave. Yes. Gone. And so the compassion Lao Tzu is talking about here is not that type of compassion. Not a partial compassion. Hey, I'm practicing compassion, but I don't like that group of people over there saying this and that. That's not compassion. That's not even impartial. And so this compassion needs to be impartial, as Lao Tzu mentioned. So this is a commitment to the, to the greater good of every human being. That's right. Not a select group of people. It's having a, a state of almost vairagya, dispassion, because, you know, the Buddha would say, for example, he would call ordinary people worldlings, right? Worldlings are the ones who are kind of ignorant of the ultimate reality. They, they've sort of wound up on their own life. But if you have sort of that dispa- dispassion, then you can have that kind of objective compassion mm. where you can see the plight of everyone and, you know, you can apply that compassion yes. everywhere. I just wanted to add uh, just a little bit on the Buddhism, Buddhist con- 
compassion in the Western world these days. That, of course, compassion and loving kindness is a part of Buddha's teaching. But as you mentioned, it's, that's not just that's not only thing, no, no. right? And uh, again, from the Westerners' perspective, this Buddha's teaching is so glorious and so amazing, right? Mm. Because it comes from the East. And some reason, again, we all have this, uh, that very fantastic idea of a different culture and different uh, traditions and teachings, right? We mm. often over-exaggerate because it's a, a, a mis- a mystery about it, right? Yep. It's something um, yeah, fantastic and something like a, almost like a, sec- sec- like a secret and like this kind of a feel to it. That's why we like to um, make it something much bigger than actually what it actually is, right? So how, that's how the classical teaching gets easily get lost. Again, uh, loving kindness and compassion is very important teaching from Buddha, but that is not the only one. The real teaching of Buddha is what? Then it's a self-discipline, and it's about, um, yeah, it is about enlightenment, but enlightenment, the word enlightenment itself is very warped these days, but it's just to realize the nature of reality and nature of yourself, your true self. And to be able to do that, there are lots of um, different kind of uh, techniques of meditation and there's uh, lots of different ways to discipline yourself and uh, loving kindness and compassion is part of that discipline. And that, again, is not the only discipline. Mm-hmm. There's a discipline for others, but uh, that also for yourself as well, right? Mm. You give uh, unconditional love, self, self-sacrificial love to everyone that will also do good things for yourself. Again, that is just one small part of the discipline in, in um, Buddhism. But as you mentioned, some um, Zen uh, what is it, Roshis <laughs> in um, <laughs> Europe and America and so on, just follow and teach about compassion and talking about that all the time as if that is the entire teaching of um, Buddha, which is uh, not true. And these teachers uh, gotta need to really um, look at themselves, what they're really teaching. And um, again, like you had uh, some um, personal contact with some people and they don't seem to be very honest with themselves because if they were true Buddhist, they would have been really open to listen to the healthy criticism, mm. or at least uh, you know, like have can afford to uh, listen to different um, ideas, right? Mm. But they won't. So that's um, I don't know that what that says about that person. It's um, it's hard to say that those people were true Buddhists, right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. So again, like uh, people just think that about Buddhism is just a loving kindness and you uh, clean out your karma and, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, to give uh, practice good mm. deed and mm. Um, mm. this and that. And uh, that's a small part of that's not everything. Uh, the, the bigger picture in Buddhism is to realize true nature and uh, reality of things, including yourself, looking within that is not a, all like fairy tale story. Sometimes they go through difficult times, and that is the um, the real teaching of Buddha, the classical teaching of Buddhism. Well, if you're not teaching the four noble truths and the eightfold noble path, then you're not teaching the words of the Buddha, right? You're not teaching his knowledge system, and. Like we said, there's a hyper focus on the moral perspective in, you know, Western Buddhism, which obviously Taoism pulls apart with its knowledge, right? Because Taoism is amoral, and obviously these fake teachers and that have a moral bent, right? And so this obviously happened from the counterculture movement in the '60s and '70s, where obviously people were opposed to certain wars and this and that. But they took Eastern spirituality and philosophy and made it into something that's just focused on morality, focused on a one-sided version of compassion. And that's you know developed into what it is today. And so those who don't have a really sharp discerning eye can be influenced by whatever narrative or ideology is being pushed on them. And so those people themselves are not following the teachings of the Buddha and they're not coming to 
the ultimate teaching of the Buddha, as you said, which is nirvana, which is to blow the candle out. Mm. If the candle is blown out, and the candle here is the identity, the identity is blown out. Because if you blow the candle of the identity out, they wouldn't have a partial perspective, right? And so that type of compassion is not the compassion that Lao Tzu is speaking about. We need to keep that in mind. And just for everyone listening and watching who are from the West, you need to be wary of these certain teachers and this and that. As soon as they have a political orientation or they have a version of morality that adapts to CNN or New York Times, for example, that's a red flag on the play. And so the second treasure that we come to is conservation or economy. Yes, yeah, so conservation or economy. And also, at the same time, you could say a bit of uh, frugality. Yes. As in like a natural natural way of living, right? Mm-hmm. Like Just like Lao Tzu himself and just like um, Zhuang Zha himself. They weren't rich people. No. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, in some stories in Zhuangzi, in the book Zhuangzi, saying like uh, some, like the king or someone who in a uh, important position would invite the Zhuangzi to hear um, some advice from him, but he would turn up with some just like just terrible uh, the way that he dressed and because just the. Clothes are dirty and ripped apart here <laughs> and there, and it's, it's, yeah, he doesn't wash himself well and this and that. But because he enjoyed the, just the natural way of living, which is actually the frugal way of living, maybe not not that stage, but mm-hmm. um, yeah. So I think the conservation is also a good way to put it because uh, you're not you are not wasteful no. of things. Um, again, a ra- natural way of living is uh, you are content with the, what you are given, mm. right? So that's almost like a wu way, right? It effortlessly, what come to you is uh, is it really? You need to work within that uh, limitation, right? And if you are um, searching more than that, then it's being somewhat greedy, right, you can say. So, and also we know that uh, being frugal, um, I mean, materialistically speaking, that you will have more things on your plate so that you can also share with others as well. Mm. So that uh, leads to like that, yeah, mercy, the compassion as well. So frugality um, leads to the generosity here uh, he mentions. Yeah. Yeah, the conservation of one's energy is is very important on the path, and as you mentioned, you know, allow things to come to you in a, in a very wu way what yeah. manner. Like live your life effortlessly, and you know, in, jo- in Zhuang's sense, if he doesn't come across a bath, he's just going to stay dirty forever. <laughs> I mean, extreme <laughs> example. He is the ultimate image of uh, politically incorrect. <laughs> thank God, and so yeah, it's important that we conserve our energy and like you said frugality frugality is thing that a lot lot of people don't practice in the modern day because it sounds stupid right but like usually when we have too many options that's when humans get confused when you have less options in life life feels more simple life feels more healthy actually when you go to the supermarket and you've got a whole aisle for cereal a whole aisle for bubble gum a whole aisle for steak i mean you're just like you're lost. You're lost. It's it's a sea of products, you know. And so you and I, for example, when we live in the places that we like to live in India, we usually live in a lot of smaller communities and we often make our own food at home. And so our options are much more limited. Ironically, though, the food's more healthy. <laughs> Well, that's right. It's uh, I mean, like locally grown fruit and vegetables mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. so on. It's uh, yeah, it's simple, simple life. So that you don't, you know, where that you don't have a stress to what to choose. Like, no. you know, if you there is too many options, like you said, the whole aisle full of um, cereals and whatnot, then you you don't know what to choose, right? It's yeah. kind of a it's a little bit like I think a burdensome to your mind it's very subtly in the end. But if you live simple life, you just got to eat what's there, right? Yeah. Uh, life is a, a lot simpler. 
Yeah, because a complex life scatters your energy, right? And so this is what Lao Tzu is saying. Like, we can't conserve our energy when our energy is scattered. Like, if we go into a supermarket, look, there's nothing wrong with going to a supermarket per se. But, like, having so many options, being so confused by this complex world, your, your energy system is scattered, constantly scattered. And so Lao Tzu is talking in this chapter when he's in speaking about this treasure is that when you have like your energy is directed in a certain way, mm-hmm. that's how you can have the most effect on life, the biggest impact on life, mm-hmm. not just your own life, but the lives of others. Mm-hmm. When your energy is scattered, you can't really have any impact on your own life or someone else's because your energy is not directed in a certain way. It's going everywhere. It's going everywhere. And so, you need to have a focus in your life and and this is what part of the conservation of energy is if you mm-hmm. if you conserve it's actually in it's funny in focusing on one particular thing that's how you conserve your energy as a writer like i see budding writers and i and i speak to young writers and that often and they'll say i can't focus you know because i've got the word doc open but then all these tabs are open you know, and there's all of this, these carrots being dangled, and it's like, well, your your focus is not one directional; it's scattered all over the place. You can't focus on one thing. Gotta go back to the old manual way, pen and paper. The way that I do. Just to turn off all the your digital device and just sit down, pen and paper. That's right, <laughs> and that's the best way to write a book. Yes. You know, like as you know, because you live with me and. We are married, and, and so <laughs> you know you see the way that how I operate when I write a book. You know, yes. lock lock yourself in the room. There's yes. no such thing as digital technology in the room, and pen and paper, worst writing in the world. But I somehow can understand it. Mm. Only you can. <laughs> no one can. But that's how you actually create something in your life that matters. When your life, when your energy is scattered, how can you create any anything that's meaningful? for yourself or for others, right? So yeah, conservation of energy is very, very important. You need to have a commitment to this because otherwise you'll just live your life and then by the time it's to depart this life, you'll think back and like, what was it all about? Mm. Because my mind was scattered most of the time. I wasn't conscious and, a, and, and fully present where I am. I was off in the past and in the future and haphazardly moving through life with an infinite amount of options. Mm. But I, I just wasn't ever really there. That's right. And I wondered why this year went so fast. I wondered why this day went so fast this week. And it's because you weren't present. When you're present and aware, years go longer, weeks go longer, days go longer because you're there, you're present. But when you're always looking at the clock or looking for something to finish and this and that, then, man, your life is on fast forward. Mm. Yeah, I think this actually second treasure, uh, Lao Tzu is talking about this economy or conservation or frugality is not only actually very physical, uh, yeah, physical and uh, material sense. It's maybe with the, what you're saying, also more so internal thing too, mm. even frugal to your thoughts, That's right? right. Yeah. Frugal to your like energy spending, for example, mm. so that you can direct your energy and focus your energy in the in the right way and to the right target, for instance. In that way, you can also have a lots of space because your energy is not scattered. Your energy hasn't been wasted, so to say, so that you have so much energy to give to people mm. like give much love or you know compassion and so like uh, also the internal generosity of someone so you can also see it that way that's right and these first two are tied together with the third treasure right so we come to humility or as derek says not daring to be ahead in the world <laughs> so that's an odd uh, way of describing it right mm. like if you said to an entrepreneur or someone who is business oriented have you dared not to be ahead in the world <laughs> yeah like you they might look at you like what, what a loser yeah, what a loser. <laughs> yeah that's right that's right but there's a reason why Lao Tzu says this and you know we've discussed all through the series one essential character trait 
of Taoism that keeps recurring each episode, which is humility, right? And so this third treasure is obviously humility. Mm. And so if we're talking about leadership, if we're talking about truly leading others, and we've spoken about this in other chapters, the only way to do that is to play a supporting role. Mm. And so that seems very strange, right? But it's in playing a supporting role that you understand how to lead, how to lead. Or it, that's how you effectively lead, that's right. let's say. Because you're listening to the, the needs of others mm. rather than being a dictator and telling them that this is what's going to happen and so forth and so on, right? And there may be times in life when that may be necessary, but 99% of the time the mode of operation should be a supporting role, right? So it's always about listening to the concerns of others or, mm-hmm. or even listening to the concerns of yourself as well, mm-hmm. as well right? So, uh, so, so not daring to be ahead in the world, so leading from behind. Mm. And this is actually how you make the biggest impact in life. That's right. Humility is, uh, again, one of the m- most important elements to understand Taoist philosophy, that uh, leading from behind, which is from looking at a bigger picture, isn't it? Mm, like yeah, when right. you look at the bigger picture on whatever situation you're in, or even look at looking at the your immediate environment or society, the world, universe. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you can um, make the picture as big as you want, but what the, the, the very source of everything to work as it does is because of that humble element mm-hmm. of, of the universe, really. Yeah. Like, again, simply when we watch a good movie, how could be a good movie without good supporting actors, for example? If there, were, if every single character was to be main actor, that would be just horrible, right? <laughs> there is no, uh, no art at all, right? Mm-hmm. So it's the same thing. In, um, uh, so how important it is to play somewhat supporting supporting role in your real in your actual life is make everything in the bigger picture in the end make it perfect so that's what we need to understand that again uh, actually Nelata in this very chapter he make fun of not uh, not having humility that you want to be first hmm. like something That's like right. this right so in Lao's perspective that is just uh, absurd yeah that's right that's right and yeah even if we look at you know, using your movie analogy looking at directors right mm. often the be- best directors are the ones well they obviously you don't see their directors in the movie they are leading from behind naturally but the best directors are the ones who l- listen and are open to new sometimes new ideas on the run as well from from actors or producers or or so forth and so on. They, a lot of the best directors, for example, don't want to be the, the center of attention. Mm. And that's why they became a director. They don't want to be the main actor. <laughs> Obviously, the main actor wants to be the center of attention, or maybe it just happened that way. But what we're speaking about also has unfortunately infected the spiritual community, mm. where in the modern day, we've got a lot of self-proclaimed, self-claimed gurus who... You know, uh, it becomes more about them than it becomes the teachings. And so when you listen to a guru or a so-called guru and they have, they've made up their own enlightenment story or so forth and so on and it's all about them rather than the teachings, that again is another red flag on the play um, because they're trying to make themselves a centre of attention, trying to make themselves a so-called authority basically on everything and... That is essentially a red flag on the play where the older gurus, let's say before social media and going back possibly before the, the 1950s, that they were all about the teachings and the reason why people were attracted to them were to learn. Mm. And if we're talking about gurus, they, they want to learn the Brahma Vidya, the knowledge of Brahman. And so that's why they would go to them because they have that knowledge they abide in that. They've also been trained in the doctrines and this and that. So they have the information, the knowledge that laymen are, are yearning for. And so unfortunately, though, in the modern day, it's become an industry where everyone's 
falling over each other to be the best guru or the most popular guru that they can be. And there's obviously a lack of humility there. And, you know, if you want to learn proper traditional knowledge, maybe look at certain lineages or or traditions like you know, the Vedanta Society, for example, I highly recommend because they are actual trained swamis in the knowledge and this and that and don't really have a yearning to be the centre of attention mm-hmm. or, a, or a, you know, one of these fake gurus and so forth and so on. So it's important to be able to discern that, to be able to see that, to see the this forest for the trees, right? So, Yes, um, with the guru is that, yeah, uh, some people will come out and like, hey, I'm your guru now. Like, hey, <laughs> like, look at me, the, the dress up all mm. like, um, like, let's say Osho or someone like that, right? <laughs> and a big beard and a nice, um, like a dress, yeah. white, and yeah. sit in a certain way with a blanket over their laps and do the, do the deed, you know? And then, like, and these people often use their mm, disciples or followers, whatever you want to call them. And and then they create like a sort of competition among them and like start donating lots of money and whatnot and the rest is history, you know. And uh, unfortunately, naive people fall for it. Mm. But again, like you mentioned, they're looking for the teaching is a right way to find the authentic teacher. That's right. Because there's a teaching that lives on. The mm. teacher don't live on. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to pass me on but you'll be dead, like the teaching lives on, which makes completely no sense. (laughs) So the most influential leaders are the ones who try not to be the center of attention. They lead from behind. They don't take credit. They pay credit to others. A good example of this is like a a good rugby league player in the National Rugby League in Australia. It's a cliche, but they'll all say, uh, credit to the boys. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and you know, look, enough of the false modesty, right? <laughs> you were the reason they won. But there's actually a, an innocence in that yes. because they actually do think like that. They mm. think that, you know, for example, they can't do what they do without everyone else. And that's it's, – it's a, it's a good mindset to have. A lot of us can't do anything without other people, mm. right? And so – there should be natural humility and deference to others and so forth and so on because what are our lives without the lives of others? Yes. You know, so if you're trying to be the centre of attention, you're trying to gain followers and this and that, you, you're, you've gone down a real dark path, to be honest. Yeah, that's very inhuman. Inhuman, yeah. yes. Mm. So it is so important to follow these three treasures as Lao Tzu was explaining, you know, because... For example, if we have courage without compassion, it often leads to brutality, right? Mm-mm. Without humility, it leads to arrogance. Mm. You know, all of these types of things, right? A lot of negative consequences That's right. come from not abiding in, in these three treasures of Lao Tzu. Yeah. Okay, guys, we hope you enjoyed and we'll see you guys next time.